Hello, everyone, and welcome today to our webinar on human rights, due diligence, and the environment. Today's webinar is being facilitated by the International Association for Impact Assessment, or IAIA. And my name is Keisha Blazer. I'll be facilitating today's webinar, but you'll mainly be hearing from our two presenters who you'll meet in a moment. So first, before we get started, I'd like to talk a little bit more about IAIA and who we are, and also let you know that if you hear anything today during the webinar that you'd like to share, feel free to do so on social media. We have our, um, hash or our tag there, the at IAIA network, along with a hashtag IAIA webinars that you can use to share. So before we get started, I want to invite you to go to our website and check out a few of the resources we have there. First off, we have a variety of webinars on demand. So recently we had strengthening the S and ESG, social impact assessment for major projects, as well as a webinar on embedding community investment into ENS standards of international financial corporations. So those are just a couple of the webinars that we have, <clears throat> excuse me, but there are a variety of topics, including biodiversity, resettlement, and more. So please go check those out. Next up, you can also find information on upcoming events. So most importantly, we have our IAIA24 annual conference, which is being held in Dublin, Ireland at the end of April. Registration closes soon on April 4th. So if you're at all interested in going to the conference or attending a training course or a technical visit, please do check those out and get registered soon. Additionally, we have a variety of short form online training courses. So if you're not able to make it to Dublin, but you would like to take a training course with us, a variety of our instructors have actually taken their in-person courses and modified them to uh, fit an online format. So we have a few coming up in June and registration is already open for these. So you can get registered ahead of time and make your plans early. So there's more effective impact assessment, tools for stronger argument and clearer writing conflict management and resolution in ESIA projects, and finally, leadership in ESIA. Those are just a variety of uh, uh, some of the courses that we have. We have a variety of other ones that you can see on our website, but those are the ones that registration is currently open for, so please go check those out. Additionally, we also have online training and mentorship through our longer professional development program, which is the Foundations of Impact Assessment program that lasts 12 weeks, and it runs from June to August. That's our next offering, and registration is currently open for that as well, so please check that out. And then finally, you can also find a variety of free downloadable publications like our Best Practice Principles, IA Fast Tips, and more, all at www.iaia.org. Now, lastly, a few key pieces of housekeeping before we get started. So yes, this webinar is being recorded, and since you're registered for the webinar, you'll be receiving an email within a day or two that contains a link to the recording along with the slides used today. If you have any questions today during the webinar, please feel free to input them. Don't feel like you have to wait till the end. We will have plenty of time for a Q&A with the presenters at the end of the webinar. But at any point, you can go to the questions tab on the control panel of the uh, GoToWebinar screen, and you can type your question in there, and that way we can um, see that for the Q&A later. And then finally, the slides are available now for you if you go to the Handouts tab in the control panel. And there you can download them or just follow along with them during the presentation. So at this point, I would like to introduce today's presenters. First, we have Sean O'Connell. Sean is a UNDP specialist supporting the implementation of UNDP's global environmental justice strategy, including on business, human rights, and the environment. Sean is a lawyer who previously worked with UNDP in Southeast Asia, focusing on governance, human rights, business and human rights, and the rule of law. Before joining UNDP, Sean worked with the Department of Foreign Affairs of Ireland and the Department of Justice of Ireland on human rights and refugee law. Next, Olga Nilova. Olga is a UNDP specialist responsible for, for providing research and developing programming on environmental dimensions of human rights due diligence for UNDP country offices and partners. Olga has over seven years of experience as a human rights specialist with the UN Developmental Development System. Before joining the UNDP Business and Human Rights Global Team, she worked with UNDP, OHCHR, and UN Residence Coordinators Offices in Lao PDR, with a focus on the UN human rights mechanisms, civic space, diversity, and inclusion. So with that, Sean and Olga, over to you. Thank you, Kesha. Um, just getting my screen ready. Can I, Kesha, can you, can you, um, is my webcam up and running? Not quite yet. 
Okay. Oh, there we go. Sorry, yeah, we popped some things are popping up. How's that? Perfect. Excellent, Keshe. Thank you so much for the introduction. And as you said, we're going to try and leave as much time for questions as possible. So just a huge thank you to IAIA and huge thank you to all, all for, for joining. Um, I'm going to time myself uh, and I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, so I will, yes, this is the one I want to start sharing. This one. Olga, you, you can't see my screen yet, no? You can't. Oh, sorry, apologies. Okay. Yeah, thank, thank you so much for your help there, Kesha. And Olga, maybe you can just let me know if we are in full slide mode. I actually can't see you, Olga, so just to... Ah, sure. Yeah, um, all good. Uh, thank you so much. So, yes, thank you very much, uh, everyone. Again, a huge thank you, Kesha, and to IAIA. Um, you know, just to say from the very beginning where we come from, we're very much from the human rights world, as, as Kesha mentioned. Um, but we've been dragged, kicking and screaming, or I should say willingly, into the world of the human rights impact assessments and human rights due diligence. Uh, and Olga and I, in particular, have been focusing on the nexus of business, human rights, and the environment. So that's hopefully what we're going to present to you today. Um, we know from the uh, survey, just to say from the beginning, that there's a mixed bag of, of participants here today, some with uh, some understanding of uh, human rights, the environment, some understanding of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. And so hopefully we're, we're not going to necessarily dive into the nitty gritty details at this stage, but just trying to enlarge in the awareness levels among the IAI members or whoever is joining the, the discussion here today and um, just to say as well that we do want to take some time at the end to receive your inputs and your feedback because this is a, something of an emerging area or, or two worlds that are colliding and we still don't quite know exactly how they're going to collide. So um, from the very beginning I want I don't want to just point to three reasons kind of why we're here uh, and just kind of three key messages just to take right from the outset before we start. And that is that the world of the worlds, I should say, of human rights and the environment are colliding quite quickly. Those in the human rights field are having to uh, work more on environmental issues and vice versa. We find people who have traditionally been working in the environment are starting to have to deal with human rights principles and standards more and more. So hopefully we're going to dive into that a little bit more. The second thing is we have this emerging area of human rights due diligence and what this could mean for impact assessments, for corporate sustainability more generally, but we know that this concept is, is picking up a pace, including in legislative developments uh, at the UN, we're developing guidance on human rights due diligence in the environment uh, as UNDP. And we know that the, the demand for expertise on human rights due diligence is, is increasing, especially with the corporate sustainability uh, due diligence directive uh, coming from the EU. Uh, but not, that's just one of many uh, instruments that, that are being uh, looked at, especially mandatory human rights due diligence instruments. But the final point is that we don't yet exactly know how we're, all this is going to manifest itself in practice. Uh, we don't know exactly who is going to help and support businesses in conducting this human rights due diligence. Um, we probably will only know when we get our hands dirty, but I just wanted to pose one question from the outset, and that would be, what would be the role of, of impact assessors here? And we really think there's a huge role and a lot of overlap between the work of impact assessors and the move towards human rights due diligence. So I propose to go through these slides and, and just give you a little bit of background and, and, and we already have some questions for you. So I'll briefly touch on the global context, which doesn't, doesn't need much of a, an introduction. Some trends, some of the ways we're responding, how we're guiding businesses, and then looking at this key question on human rights due diligence and impact assessment. Global context. So what we're really talking about here, just to be clear, is we're really talking, we're focusing more on the environmental part of human rights due diligence. And it's a bit of a, a misnomer. It's a bit of a, a, a almost, a, it's confusing for many people, but we're not just talking about human rights due diligence, the traditional human rights issues. We're focusing on where human rights and the environment are coming together. We'll explain more in, in detail as the, as the presentation goes on, but just to say from the outset that we're focusing not necessarily, we're not focusing on labor rights or what you might consider more traditional human rights, but we're focusing on this new area of right to a healthy environment and human rights that are related to environmental harms. The harms themselves need no introduction, pollution, climate change, biodiversity loss. We know that globally 70 mil or 7 million people are, 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 are uh, um, dying prematurely from air pollution, the impacts of climate change, biodiversity loss, 
what we now are realizing more and more is how all these issues are impacting on uh, human rights and the lives of people, more so than we did. And I think air pollution is a good example, you know, it, just the extent to which air pollution is harming humans, harming their health. Uh, obviously, climate change is an area that's picking up a lot of pace in terms of us understanding how much it is impacting on human rights. But biodiversity, possibly a little bit less or a little bit further behind, but again, picking up pace in terms of making a stronger connection between these environmental harms and the impact on people. And we know that as a result of understanding more of how severe these environmental harms are, are impacting on people's human rights, including the right to life, health, education, livelihoods, um, it is having, sorry, it's having a, huge impact on on uh, on people and so our responses to it are increasing and that's why we're seeing things like human rights due diligence law emerge we're seeing uh, stronger regulations and enforcement around environmental harms we're seeing more litigation and i will touch on a little few of those trends now just to really emphasize that these worlds are colliding uh, and I, I, our understanding of, of the impact of environmental harms on human rights and people's lives is only increasing and so too, we, we, we expect will our response and the severity of the, the, the uh, sanctions for those who violate uh, human rights and environmental uh, law. So in terms of the global trends, um, this is just again to emphasize where we really see uh, human rights and the environment colliding, if you will. Um, one of the first areas is at the UN level. And this is important for many respects. Of course, we're at the UN and, and, and we're not fooling ourselves into thinking everything that gets discussed or happens at the UN is of immediate importance to the world and often it's, it's in a somewhat of an ivory tower. But it is a good indication of the thinking of the international community. And for many years, there has been an effort to try and recognize that there, are hum that are, there is a right to a healthy environment. And in 2022, that was adopted by the UN General Assembly. So you now have consensus in the international community that there is a right to a healthy environment that really was not recognized before. You would have had to look for different uh, environmental harms that impact human rights, but now we're saying that you don't even have to find the impact on your right to health or education. It is in itself a right to have a safe uh, climate or, or be free from pollution. So I'll dive into that a little bit in a second, but another important area is on the mandatory human rights due diligence legislation, especially at the EU level. Again, probably doesn't need any introduction here. I'm sure many of the practitioners are aware of, of this legislative trend, as well as what it could mean for practice, including your profession. And thirdly, on the litigation side, and there, we're just seeing an increase uh, of, of cases, maybe typically were environmental in nature, but now have very strong human rights framing, and vice versa. Human rights cases or take cases taken in human rights courts with very strong environmental technical information uh, or evidence being brought with them. So just to dive a little bit deeper here in, in the background to all this, we've really seen these fields separated and I'm interested to hear from the impact assessment world if that's also been the case. Uh, and the top line here, you'll see the, the kind of development or evolution of human rights law post-World War II with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And then through the 60s, we saw more and more conventions and treaties. And these are probably more in the areas that you typically associate with racial discrimination, gender equality, children's rights, civil and political rights. And then we see it emerge more and more into the, into the corporate world. Uh, and then we had the UNGPs, the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights in 2011. Similarly, the world of environmental legislation, international environmental law, picking up huge pace, a, a lot of declarations, a lot of political commitments and agreements, international uh, environmental conventions. And I mean, it's, it's, it's a very, um, if you will, a rough outline, a rough sketch of these two worlds colliding. But, but just to make the point that they really do converge now in 2022 and are recognized to, as converging. So that now we, we're not really speaking about two different fields of work or in the future we might not be, but we will be speaking when we talk about human rights protection, we will be including in that the, the environmental harms and issues like uh, climate change, biodiversity loss and pollution. Um, in terms of this resolution I mentioned, if you want to understand more about this resolution, what it might mean for your field, UNDP together with the UN Human Rights Office uh, and the United Nations Environment Programme published an information note 
uh, just uh, in light of this uh, new resolution. Again, it, it, it happens in an ivory tower, so the question is what does it mean in practice? So we have unpacked this and what it means um, potentially for, you, for, for the impact assessment field, but for, for many fields of, 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 or many disciplines. So within this resolution, within this uh, right to a healthy environment, we have now outlined some substantive human rights. They include the right to a safe climate, clean air, uh, biodiversity protected, uh, sufficient water, healthy food, and non-toxic environment, as well as these key procedural rights in relation to the environment, such as access to justice uh, and, and information and participation in decision-making. So now again, this really has put the environment right into the world of human rights. And conversely, we're seeing the environment, environmental world now rethink how it approaches its work and trying to put people more at the center um, of its efforts. Um, the mandatory human rights due diligence discussion then really comes hot in the heels of uh, almost 10 years of unpacking this concept of human rights due diligence, which was really first introduced in the UN Guiding Principles of business, on Business and Human Rights in 2011, after a long period of lobbying, and as many of you know, even up to the last minute a, a week ago or a couple of days ago, in trying to make mandatory this concept of human rights due diligence, acknowledging that some of the voluntary measures uh, being put towards, being put to companies in, in, in terms of compliance and ensuring corporate responsibility were failing. And we're seeing it pop up more and more now. Of course, the EU is just is, is just one. We, we have the uh, Corporate Vigilance Law of France, the Supply Chain Act of Germany, the Netherlands is exploring similar uh, legislation in Korea as well. The draft bill has been, has been uh, put forward by the opposition. So it's definitely coming down the line. It's a, definitely an emerging trend. Um, what we see in human rights due diligence legislation is not necessarily what was fully envisaged in the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, but it's a very important start. And it really is putting human rights right at the, the forefront, or human rights due diligence, I should say, um, in terms of uh, uh, corporate compliance and, and really forcing businesses to invest in, in, in this compliance. So the third one, again, is, is just another trend where we can clearly see that, that this, these worlds are colliding. And, you know, again, typically where you would have had a lot of uh, claims focusing a lot on environmental issues and now with this right to a healthy environment, and, and in some cases, in, not necessarily in these cases, but in previous cases, where we have this right to a healthy environment, uh, just last year, or even just this year, the European Court of Human Rights, we have this right to a healthy environment is being cited, along with environmental uh, evidence, and technical information, scientific information on climate change, in particular for the Agostino Duarte case taken at the European Court of Human Rights. But again, in the corporate world, similarly, businesses are having to manage risks, uh, not just uh, for environmental compliance, but that the human rights impacts that those environmental harms can cause. And it can be difficult to manage those risks because those risks are now integrated and it requires an integrated look at both. You can't just approach it from a purely technical scientific perspective. You need to also think about some of the wider human rights impacts of these environmental harms. And uh, this can be a huge challenge for businesses. And we, we know, um, in particular from our work with businesses on our business and human rights program, a huge demand from businesses for guidance in this area and more practical support in terms of how to navigate and integrate these two worlds. So in terms of how we've been responding, um, just keeping an eye on the time here, Olga, and I'll also appreciate jumping in at any stage, um, but in terms of how we're responding, and, and I won't spend too much time on this, uh, but just to say, you know, how, how, what, what can be done here? I mean, we, we're typically, no, no surprise at the UN, we're, we're, we're having to force and, 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 and not necessarily force, but uh, encourage uh, convening of groups together that don't typically speak, in particular the environmental world and the human rights world. I mean, I can say even within the UN, these worlds don't necessarily speak to each other. So I imagine it's the same at the corporate level. And I'm interested even at the at the level of uh, individual or, or um, organizations of impact assessors, whether this integration is happening uh, more and more or at least being explored. Uh, we continue to work with governments. At the end of the day, we it's critical that this this these uh, either human rights due diligence or the integration of human rights and the environment um, has state support, whether it be in binding law, policy, other instruments and supports to businesses to actually, to actually be able to navigate this. 
Uh, and then finally, of course, direct guidance for businesses themselves. And that's what we're, our guide is, is focusing on, where we acknowledge that for many businesses, including practitioners that support businesses in terms of expertise and advice, that there's good guidance on how to navigate this integration of human rights and the environment through human rights due diligence. So what does it all mean um, in terms of what we're doing? We have a number of these uh, multi-stakeholder platforms uh, globally. Again, I won't spend too much time. I would say keep an eye out for them. It's a good opportunity to hear from businesses, from government. Um, we had one very successful discussion last year in Bangkok on the corporate sustainability and, and environmental rights in Asia, where we were bringing together large multinationals, suppliers on the ground, CSOs, government representatives, and individual consultants and, and impact assessment practitioners to exchange on what might be needed, what the challenges are, what might be needed to integrate human rights in the environment. Um, look out for the one near you. We'd be very happy to share. You can go to our website or reach out to us to find out where and when these are, but we're typically hosting them in Asia. We are hosting them in Asia, I should say. We're going to be hosting a discussion in, in for the European region, Eastern Europe region, um, and the start of next year for the South Asian region, um, as well as we just concluded in the Caribbean, in Latin America, and, and of course, a, a large one in, in Africa last year in Addis Ababa. So, in terms of our government support, uh, this is obviously the bread and butter of the UNDP. Ongoing support to governments uh, in the world of business and human rights that takes the shape of national action plans on business and human rights or NAPs. And within that, those NAPs, there's a series of actions and commitments to enact laws and policies, provide training for government officials, guidance for businesses, increase access to justice for, for communities affected and for rights holders. So of course, this remains a key part of our work. And, it, and we really have to highlight that because when we present to businesses, one of the first responses is, yeah, well, don't, don't whatever about what we're supposed to do, what about the, uh, the role of the government, their duty to protect human rights, their, their duty to invest and to regulate and to, to hold those accountable that undermine efforts to be more responsible and sustainable even though some companies are investing huge amounts in it, they can get very easily, um, other business can undermine those efforts if, they're, if, they're, if, if, if when violations occur that it's not actually enforced. So that has been our bread and butter, but really this is where we're, this is kind of what has brought us to the uh, IAIA, and this is the guidance on um, one, one key area here in, in addition to our training for businesses on business human rights to our academy, is this guidance, and I think this is what we'd really like to speak to you uh, more about, is guidance for businesses on integrating human rights in the environment through human rights due diligence. And just to say, of course, this guidance is directed at businesses, but in, in, in the process of consulting with well over 180 different stakeholders, 60 plus businesses, CSOs, practitioners, and consultants, we, we're very much aware that individual practitioners on impact assessment consultants and uh, play a huge role in translating all this guidance into practice for businesses who for many don't have uh, sufficient or existing capacity to translate this into practice, but they are very much aware of the need to do so and to do so quite quickly. So our guidance is an effort just to guide businesses, but also for practitioners who work and support businesses to be guided also. Um, and I think that's what we'll, we'll, we'll jump into now. So how, what, what is this human rights due diligence? And, and that's, well, sorry for taking so long to get to what is a very important question. But it's, it's really, as an overall objective here of human rights due diligence is to identify, prevent, mitigate, and account for how uh, businesses address potential and actual, human, uh, actual adverse human rights impacts. And really now, what human rights due diligence in the environment is doing, now that we have this resolution recognizing the right to a healthy environment, is that we've put the environment into that human rights due diligence objective. You can easily find a, enough information on what human rights due diligence from the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights at a general level, how it translates into more uh, into, into practice at a more detailed level, and how you add the environmental nuances is the piece that's been missing. And that's the piece that we're trying to uh, fill with our guide. So with that in mind, it's it's, the framing we've used for our guide is around this triple planetary crisis of pollution, in particular land, water, and air pollution, uh, and climate change, and biodiversity loss. So again, the idea is that 
using the human rights due diligence process, how businesses can adopt a human rights based approach to addressing risks in across these environmental harms. Uh, many businesses are, have already for many years been working on uh, compliance or efforts to 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 uh, uh, on, on envi pollution, do, environmental due diligence processes in relation to pollution. Climate change is a growing area and as I mentioned before biodiversity coming down the line but how they all connect to human rights and, and, and in, in more detail and in practice is what the guide is, is hoping to uh, uh, achieve. This is what it looks like in practice. It is a guidance, the first step of human rights due diligence is of course identifying and assessing these human rights impacts. So it's, it's very much a desk-based job for businesses, uh, not an easy one. And some of you who responded to the survey mentioned that you have some familiarity with this area and with the UNGPs and this process. The second, of course, is then to actually, based on that mapping and that desk-based process, it's not desk-based, of course, there's a key area, part of that is engaging with communities, but really the action comes after that. And that is that when you've identified those impacts is to take actions to mitigate those, those impacts. The third area, of course, is to track that over time. This is a responsibility of businesses to be able to, to track those efforts. Uh, and, and of course, finally, to, to communicate um, those in particular to rights holders and in particular in the environmental context where it might be more complex or maybe technical, um, the responsibility there is to, uh, is to communicate effectively to those uh, rights holders. So when, when we put the environmental lens on this human rights due diligence process, what's different and what's new and what businesses might have been struggling with and they need help with? In terms of identifying risks, uh, it's a huge issue when we think about the, the, the entire value chain of business and trying to get through what it might be, you know, what, 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 what is the scope or limitation of where their human rights um, risks lie. So certainly help need, there, need it there. I will say in terms of geographical locations, it's becoming more and more important to consider in the biodiversity context where businesses have to really uh, use advanced technology to locate where their, uh, where their activities or actions are in their value chain and then identify possible risks, for example, to biodiversity or to ecosystems. And they need help with this. Um, it's, a, it's kind of an emerging area, especially if many of you are familiar with the Task Force for Nature-Related Financial Disclosures or the TNFD. It's a growing area by business to, to do better in terms of identifying where the risks are in relation to biodiversity and ecosystems. Um, another really interesting area in terms of identifying uh, uh, human rights risks is looking at affected rights holders. When we apply this environmental lens, uh, one of the challenges for businesses in the climate change context is who are they supposed to consult with? Who are they supposed to engage? So here, we, we've, we need to offer some guidance and support for businesses because they, they are still expected to speak to people who are affected by climate change, but of course, everyone is affected by climate change. So what is supposed to happen here? One of the feedback we received from, from one particular industry was, are they expected to fly to countries most affected by climate change every year, which in itself, carbon footprint, not ideal, but going to maybe, for example, the South Pacific to consult with people there, in practical course, are there other ways of, of other rights holders that should be consulted that are definitely most at risk from climate change, for example, young people? So some guidance is, is, is offered in, in, in that context, and that's a growing demand from businesses because they do, they do still have to, to engage with rights holders, even in the climate change context. In terms of acting, what's different here? What are the environmental nuances uh, in terms of uh, applying human rights due diligence with this uh, environmental lens? Or just to, just to, to um, respond very quickly that this is again, being able to use, uh, to map those actions on, on the, the business's uh, value chain and, and to assess where the business is actually involved in an impact, where it actually does need to take uh, action and what type of action it may need to take. One interesting uh, consideration here is in the climate change context, we have, of course, scope one, two, and three emissions. And in the scope three emissions, which is famously the most difficult to, to assess, what, what would be the responsibilities of businesses to take action for uh, human rights risks, in this case, carbon emissions in those scope three, in, that's in, in the scope three, uh, in scope three, which we should say, and so we offer some guidance in that respect so that businesses can, obviously it, it depends on where, where these uh, uh, involvements happen in scope one, two or three, and depending on that involvement, depending on the potential human rights risks and their impact will then lead to what type of actions should be taken, in including remediating those uh, carbon emissions. 
So it's a very difficult question. It's one that could create huge burdens for businesses, but they do need some help in navigating. Very quickly on tracking, it's not rocket science that it's about developing good indicators. It's about uh, developing indicators that move across quantitative, which is typically where the environment world has been, has been uh, tracking its progress, as well as the qualitative, which is typically where the human rights world has been tracking its progress. Businesses also need support in this area. Um, it's not easy. We're bringing together uh, typically people from the environmental world who see the human rights world as a bit more wishy-washy, uh, and is, as well, the opportunity for the human rights world to, to, to get to grips with more quantitative indicators, it's important and it's, ex, it's expectation of businesses. So we offer some guidance in that respect, uh, especially where these two worlds are coming together. And in terms of communication, I think I mentioned it already, I just focus on, on, on that one area about, it is difficult to communicate to rights holders on very technical uh, areas, especially when the environment is concerned, including on pollution, biodiversity and climate. Um, so we do offer some guidance here and some expectation of businesses, but we do know this is an area they need, they will need support uh, on. So apologies now, I'm just coming into the last uh, uh, section here. And I just, this is more just a, a, a thinking, and I'm interested to hear your thoughts about how the world of human rights due diligence and the world of impact assessments come together. I use the picture here, this is uh, the Cliffs of More. I know uh, Kesha mentioned it from the beginning that uh, the IAIA conference will be held in Dublin this year. So I hope you're all signed up and ready to go in, in a couple of weeks time. We will be there as UNDP. Um, the picture you see here, unfortunately, is not in Dublin. So you'll have to travel a bit to get to see that. That's actually where I'm from. Um, but it's a really good opportunity to start to unpack what this means and how the world of the impact assessment world and human rights due diligence world will be coming together. And I do think that there's a huge role for impact assessors. Interested to hear your thoughts, but here are some in, in initial ideas from us. So look at what is new here. Effectively, what is new from this world of human rights due diligence with the environment integrated? There's a much bigger focus uh, on, on, the, on, on risks to human rights and not to businesses. So in the world of due diligence, obviously businesses have traditionally been focusing on risks to the business. Uh, of course, human rights might form a part of that, but really here we're focusing on human rights. And that of course should be an indication to you that if the focus now is much more on human rights, we're gonna have to know what the human rights are in, in, in more detail than we typically have. Um, so that would be something that's new and that will require a, a deeper understanding of substantive and procedural human rights, uh, as well as things like the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, as well as the concept of human rights due diligence more generally. But just to say that we see that the, the, there's definitely a greater focus on getting into the details of human rights, as opposed to previously where it was more general about investigate potential human rights impacts. We're now having to get into what specific human rights we're speaking about and, um, yeah, uh, and how they might uh, relate to each other. Um, Within the world of human rights now, we have this recognition of the, of, of the right to a healthy environment, which means now that we recognize environmental harms are themselves human rights risks. This will take some getting used to. This is a new area. This is not something we've spoken about before. I mean, we would have typically looked at a, a case of pollution and said, look, if that uh, pollution gets into a water supply, it could threaten uh, health in the local community. We're not saying that anymore. We're saying the fact that there's pollution is in itself a human rights risk. And of course, we know what that means. Human rights risks, the words of human rights, the words of human rights, even just that framing is a huge risk to businesses. But of course, it's a huge risk to people as well. And, and that's going to have to be grappled with. Uh, and I think the environmental world is catching up quite quickly about what this will mean for it, including ideas like putting people at the center of their uh, processes uh, and, and, and talking more to the human rights world. There's a much greater emphasis on participation of rights holders and engagement that was that was not necessarily there before. And I know for many people uh, as on the call, uh, environmental impact assessors, that engagement, consultation is a huge part of what you do. Um, but we just see a greater emphasis on it, a greater expectation of doing it and doing it um, more thoroughly, um, more comprehensively, I suppose, and in areas where it's difficult to do it, like in a climate change context or in a biodiversity context, it might not always be easy to identify rights holders um, in relation to a particular species that is at risk uh, through business activity. So who will you speak to in that context? Maybe some local communities might not even be aware of the threat to that local species. That might be the case. So there's a great, much greater emphasis on this convening and, and, and participation and engagement or consultation um, that was there before, but is going to be there even more now. 
Um, as I said before, back to the first point really, is that we, we, there's going to be a greater effort to actually link this to substantive human rights. Um, I don't think everyone's going to need to be a human rights expert. And thankfully, the architecture, or the, the framework of human rights is not in itself that complicated. There are a lot of interpretations of what different human rights mean in practice. So, for example, we have expert independent bodies at the UN who've been unpacking what human rights mean for, in different topics. For example, we just had the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights unpack the nexus of human rights and uh, environmental, social and governance or ESG investment. Um, you know, we have the uh, Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities unpacking what um, the, protecting the rights of persons with disabilities in the context of employment means. You know, we have the reports and, and, and inter, uh, analysis from the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in the Environment on what uh, corporate responsibility means in the context of the right to healthy environment. So we're going to see more of a linking here. I don't think everyone's going to be, need to be an expert. We know there's a huge field of human rights impact assessment and we know there's an existing huge field of environmental impact assessment, but it might be again just a case of them coming together. And yeah, finally, what is quite new here, especially for the world of human rights, is in terms of conducting human rights due diligence, we're now having to add certain environmental due diligence or other processes on top of um, our human rights work. So we're starting, if we talk about what might be uh, uh, the right to be free from pollution, and you're supposed to identify that risk and, and take action on it, sorry, I'm a bit too far over time now, um, you're going to have to understand technical environmental uh, due diligence and management processes. So, in conclusion, apologies for going a little bit late over time. There is a, these these two areas are absolutely on a collision course, uh, and uh, whether it be human rights impact assessors who've been looking at this and now having to grapple with the world of the environment, or vice versa, um, there's a huge opportunity here for shared learning. We don't know exactly what this looks like, but keen to hear uh, your your feedback on this. We also know that it's human rights due diligence is, is becoming more and more the part of the course in terms of both mandatory expectations from governments, but as well as internally in businesses. This is the businesses are responding not just in compliance, but using this tool to actually manage risks. And there's just no doubt that there is a massive role for impact assessors. The skills are there uh, in terms of working with business and identifying risks, managing risks, um, advising on, on taking different actions. And there's just no doubt that they, they'll play a critical role here within this within this field. So with that, I'd like to conclude. Apologies for going a little bit over again for 25 minutes, but we're just a little bit further. And I think, Olga, if you don't mind, we'll just kick off with one or two questions um, that you've already fielded uh, from the registrations, and then we'll see what questions are coming through uh, from the chat. So thank you very much. Over to you, Olga. Thank you, Sean. Um, yeah. I'm I'm actually answering some some of the questions in the chat and maybe I'll I'll uh, start with them if you don't mind. Um, there was a question from Diana um, on how impact assessment practitioners can contribute um, to the policy work that UNDP has been doing on um, improving um, national planning and and uh, legislation um, on re uh, to regulate businesses um, in the context of environment and human rights. And um, I just wanted to basically repeat what I, what I put in the chat. Um, after the launch of the guide in the upcoming months, UNDP is actually looking for um, piloting the guide with a number of, of businesses across industries and learn uh, from their uh, practices and, and real experiences uh, of the implementation of the guide and uh, use those learnings um, within our policy uh, work, particularly on national action planning on business and human rights that Sean introduced um, in one one of the first slides. And we would, of course, be very interested in, in um, uh, including uh, impact assessment practitioners in this piloting phase of the guide and see um, whether it, it is feasible and, and helpful um, and how it can be improved and, of course, uh, use all the insights uh, from the application of the guide uh, you may have for our policy work that uh, we've been currently having in 39 countries um, on business and human rights. Um, there was another question on um, uh, overall um, adverse impacts of business on the environment uh, in the global scope uh, from Mercedes. 
and I also just I, I, I didn't have time to answer it but I'll, I'll just answer it now um, so the guide um, actually uses the framework of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights and its human rights due diligence and offers some practical steps on how to conduct human rights due diligence for cumulative impacts particularly um, impacts uh, on climate and related human rights at the global uh, scale. So it, it provides some um, recommendations on how to identify those impacts, um, how, to, how to identify um, the contribution uh, that business may uh, have into those uh, cumulative impacts, um, take action uh, appropriate um, to the contribution, um, some guidance on, on how to track it in coordination with affected rights holders, and as Sean mentioned, in some contexts like climate change with, with global scope, um, it would probably mean uh, engagement of affected rights holders uh, far from the locality of business operations. Um, for example, um, identifying cumulative uh, impacts on uh, sea level rise and related human rights of, of uh, rights holders in uh, small island states in the Pacific and then reaching out to them, particularly those most vulnerable, for example, on, on the coastlines and engage them in identifying actions and, and tracking um, of businesses' response. So just, just to say that we, we probably don't have time to discuss um, in detail how guide unpacks um, cumulative impacts, but it definitely offers uh, some guidance on, on how to uh, conduct human rights due diligence for uh, global impacts that business uh, not causes necessarily, but contributes to. Um, and I think there were more questions coming. Um, we didn't have time to read them all. Um, Sean, if you can just maybe help me. Um, I, sadly, I can't really read them all, I guess. So if you're gonna help me, or maybe Kesha can field a few. I can just see the yes, question. I, yeah, yeah. yeah I, have a, I have a couple that, if that's okay, I can. Thanks, Olga. Thank you very much. Very helpful. Yes, thank you both so much. Um, okay, so one of the questions that was asked a couple times in registration is, what are some of the key practical differences between human rights due diligence and social or human rights and environmental IAs? So maybe more of like the practical, uh, tangible differences. Yeah, th yeah, and thank you. I mean, you know, we're coming to grips with this as well. Listen, in general, the biggest issue, the biggest difference in human rights due diligence and the impact assessments is the, the ongoing nature and the proactive ongoing nature of, of, of the human rights due diligence. So when you unpack the UNGPs, you know, there is a role for um, human rights impact assessments, environmental, social impact assessments within uh, the human rights due diligence process. And I know, I understand that there's quite a flexible understanding of um, the, the impact assessments and, and, and how they can be applied, but, but really UNGP, the human rights due diligence process as outlined in the UN guiding principles is supposed to be done on an ongoing basis, very proactive. So it's not limited to one particular project, one particular partnership. Um, but I think one very concrete way that they, they will relate is where, um, well, first of all, where the skills of impact assessors will be so important in terms of helping businesses on an ongoing basis identify the biggest risks and you know, possibly guidance in terms of how to address those risks, because that's what we know impact assessors have been doing for years, have been helping to identify potential risks and, and ways, maybe not always ways of uh, addressing them, but this is what's expected in human rights due diligence. So those skills will be very transferable. But then even within the world of human rights due diligence, there may be a number of risks that are identified that part of the action to take to, to mitigate or, or you know, get to mitigate that risk would be conducting further impact assessments to see specifically what might need to be done. Um, so that there is a there is a big role for it here. I mean, it, it does depend. Again, I, I think the you know this is one of the important discussions that we have in Dublin is exactly uh, what what it will look like. But uh, I think that the most fundamental difference is the ongoing and proactive nature of human rights due diligence. Businesses are expected to do this regularly. Um, meaning they can't just do it once every five years and be like, okay, we're done, because you're identifying a risk, you're monitoring that risk as it goes up and down, and you're taking action on that risk. Uh, it's burdensome, yes, of course, it's onerous, and businesses aren't necessarily always delighted, but at the same time, recognize that it is a very helpful tool to recognize more ongoing risks um, that are changing in nature, that maybe sometimes 
impact assessments might not be able to capture in terms of their the the, the temporal nature of them or, or maybe the project specific or partnership specific or contract specific nature of them so that would be one of the main differences thank you kesha um i can also um come in if you don't mind um Maybe also to highlight, it, it very much depends on impact assessments, but human rights due diligence takes a value chain wide approach. So it looks at um, impacts in both upstream, downstream activities, in addition to those activities, um, uh, own activities by the business. Um, it also, uh, beyond the impact identification and assessment and, and action, it also has a step uh, which is called communication which requires businesses to actually proactively um, communicate on how um, uh, identify adverse uh, human rights uh, impacts have been addressed and what are the challenges in addressing those and uh, what current plans are um, in um, in addressing those impacts in the upcoming year or um, whatever period that business is looking at so it, it it also looks at, at disclosure and, um, as Sean mentioned, continued uh, improvement in addressing those impacts. Um, yeah, I, I think I'll, I'll stop here. Yeah, Sean. Kesha has loads of questions, and we'll come back to that to conclude. That's the most important question, and we'd like to come back to Kesha. Back to you. Okay, perfect. Sounds great. Um, another question that was asked during registration too is, what challenges do you face in integrating human rights and the environment in IAs? And what are some good practices that can be undertaken in integrating human rights and the environment in impact assessments? Good question. Um, I think the first challenge is that uh, people who are used to doing human rights impact assessments on this call will have no problem here, but the typical challenge is that people are not familiar with human rights. So it is always helpful to be aware of what the substantive or procedural human rights are. That's a big challenge uh, because we know that there are more Im environmental impact assessors than there are human rights impact assessors. At least that's what we've been told. So it's a very practical challenge for people without human rights understanding or experience to brush up if you will, and that's a challenge. I mean, there, there's actually a kind of uh, informal or unofficial challenge, which is that typically the people who've been doing environmental uh, impact assessments, and we know them for, even from our colleagues in UNDP, have been in the weeds of scientific data, environmental due diligence processes, real technical stuff, quantitative indicators, you know, and, and then you have people from the human rights world who are honestly not, from, not made up like that. And um, so finding someone who can do both and match those worlds who, who is good at convening discussions with rights holders on their challenges and the risks, as well as having some grasp of what these technical and scientific uh, environmental indicators might be and, and, and bringing them together, um, that's, that's a big challenge. Um, I think in terms of good practice, I mean, so far it's, it's early days. I, don't, there, I mean, as I said, the right to a healthy environment is about two years old. So we don't, have, we don't see many people with both these areas of expertise, full stop. We see people like ourselves, like myself and Olga, who are coming to grips with it as quickly as we can, acknowledging our ignorance when it comes to very detailed environmental processes. Um, but I think it has to be done in, in together at this stage, if you know what I mean. I feel like it has to be, people with this environmental expertise are gonna have to reach out with people with human rights expertise and vice versa. And there needs to be a kind of a, a breaking down of these silos. Um, and I think over time then we'll find a middle ground. Um, but I just wanted to say that I think the world of human rights can really learn a lot from uh, environmental uh, due diligence impact assessments. Like we've learned a lot from our colleagues who've been working on the environment for years. Uh, one of the big benefits or contributions the world of human rights can make to the environmental world is we can really square both the risks and the efforts to mitigate those risks in the lives of people, you know, and this is, uh, this is what we hope to do. Um, and, uh, you know, very often we look at some of the ways of, of you know, especially compliance driven environmental impact assessments and efforts to measure. And, and, and we know, as I said from the beginning of the presentation, our understanding of how hum, uh, the environment is impacting human rights is increasing. Like we would have been conducting types of assessments before on air pollution, really underestimating the type of impact that's having on people. Um, you know, we had a similar situation on, on uh, efforts to monitor uh, soil degradation or pollution in soil acknowledging now that that might not be, you know, will not restore that land for maybe a century. So then the, human, the impact on human rights there in terms of health or livelihoods is huge. So yeah, I think uh, both worlds will, will, will benefit from each other, uh, but the good practice is I don't think people will be doing it on their own for the next uh, few years. It'll have to be done in, uh, together and the 
Dublin is a good place to, that both will be there. The impact is the human rights ones and the environmental impact assessors. Good question. Thank you. Um, I can come in, come in as well because there was a similar question from Mercedes coming in the chat um, on how to make different teams, uh, particularly those uh, related to the environment and human rights, um, work together. Um, and we actually collected a couple of um, good examples and uh, offered some guidance in, in the guide that Sean presented. Um, they actually are quite diverse. Some businesses uh, start with simply seating arrangements uh, by bringing uh, teams closer to each other. Um, some businesses um, have cross-functional workshops for both teams or, uh, for example, sharing systems uh, where materials and um, uh, joint work is happening. And of course, um, those that are more advanced uh, build some joint risk management systems, joint risk registers, joint, joint tracking. And as Sean mentioned, um, by basically merging tracking, um, it, it could help uh, both teams to, to start working more and more closely together. Uh, while, for example, environmental teams uh, predominantly work with um, uh, quantitative uh, indicators and scientific projections, human rights team uh, tend to work with qualitative, uh, very lived experience um, specific data. So by merging um, the tracking and uh, merging uh, two natures of indicators in, in one tracking system would, would help um, break silos, as, as we heard from a couple of businesses we consulted um, towards the development um, of the guide. And of course, there are examples on uh, shared accountability structures, um, some joint action plans and, and strategies, but as, as Sean mentioned, um, uh, when just talking to the majority of businesses, uh, we see that there's still um, a lot of work needs to be done to um, break silos and, and bring two um, different worlds within business. Yeah. Can I just say anecdotally, because I know we have five minutes to go, anecdotally, it's much harder to get the environmental people to see the world through the human rights lens than it is the other way around. The environmental people find the world of human rights so frustrating, inaccurate, general, wishy-washy, full of crap. So, you know, uh, just FYI, it'll be the human rights people reaching out more likely. Uh, over to you, Kesha. We will try and be rapid with the responses. We see there's a load of questions, not much time. Yes, this is kind of kind of jumping off that last question a little bit. Um, how could the private sector be engaged in human rights due diligence as part of the organizational culture, not just a compliance exercise? So how could it be part of the organization or business DNA? Do you have any tips on that? The most important thing we've noticed is that businesses still approach human rights due diligence like a typical due diligence process, meaning they're looking at which human rights impact their business. It is quite possible to find human rights risks that are not going to pose a huge risk to the business. Maybe the group is so small, they're so removed, they have no voice. And uh, the biggest change is to consider the responsibility towards human rights first. And then, I mean, look at very naive, very pie in the sky, typical things someone from the UN would say, but that's, that's what this whole movement is about, is trying to get them to consider, finding, sorry, it cut out there, trying to get them to consider human rights first. Um, the way to do that is, yeah, it probably starts from the top, to be honest. Um, it's, it's hard to, to, to push for it, but uh, it, it, it's to get that thinking is when you're starting to map these human rights, stop to stop people or you know, try and push back on people who stop on the one that's the biggest risk to the business. Um, there might be one that's a, a big, big risk to the business, but there's another one that's a bigger risk to a different group that's less of a risk to the business. And that's one of the biggest differences that this process is supposed to, to drive uh, and, and this should be pushed back within businesses when you start getting into that more traditional mindset of uh, due diligence. That's not what it's about. And I'll just add very quickly, um, yeah, businesses usually start with uh, putting together a human rights uh, policy commitment um, just to uh, agree on what priorities would be for, for a business um, in a particular time frame and uh, following the adoption of, of um, human rights policy commitment at, at the senior seniorest level. Um, they usually do trainings to make sure that all staff across functions, even those that are not obviously related to human rights, like procurement, for example, or marketing, um, actually I way of, of human rights policy commitment and understand what it means um, in practice for uh, those not non-obvious departments. So, um, and then uh, human rights due diligence is, is the second component of, of, of corporate respect for human rights. 
uh, followed by remediation uh, mechanism. Can, if I can, yeah, but if I can revise, because I hear you seeing, oh, okay, if I can revise my answer slightly to make it less naive, I would start with the biggest human rights to the, you know, risk to the business, and then from within that, then start working on the wider human rights. It's too naive mm. to go and say, oh, we must think about the wider human rights part. Business is like, you know, I'm not responsible for all human rights. Start with the biggest one. Um, one very helpful tip is the engagement part, you know, where business leaders have to engage with rights holders. It doesn't happen very often, doesn't happen very uh, effectively, but it can be a good way to change mindsets. And then, you know, you unpack, unpack that big risk. And after that, you can explore those other human rights risks that are yeah. over to you, Kesha. OK, great. I think we have time for a couple more questions. Um, this one's kind of switching gears a bit, but from Sarah. So have or will you be involved in the updates to the IFC performance standards, which state they are broadly convergent with the UN guiding principles on business and human rights? Uh, she says this framework is often used by ENS practitioners for impact assessments and ENS due diligence. So have you or will you be involved in that? We want to be. Uh, it depends. You see, the problem, it's not a problem, but the normative organization is the UN human rights organization. So when it comes to aligning the UNGPs, that's their job. Our effort is to try and translate it into practice. So honestly, if, if it is aligned with the UNGPs, what we would be interested in is translating that into more detailed practical guidance. You know, most of these things that get set up at that level, including the UNGPs, I challenge any of these impact assessors on the call today to pick up the UNGPs and know what to do. They're, they're at that level that's too high. So... You know, in terms of aligning with the UNGPs, we probably won't have much of a role there. We would like to participate in the in the development, but it's more so when they're ready that we want to translate them into something more practical for people to be able to pick up and use. So no plans yet, but we would welcome an opportunity to do that. And we'll speak to our colleagues in the UN Human Rights Office to see if we can participate on the IOC. Great, thank you. And another question, um, so is, and just kind of to clarify, for, I think for all the attendees are probably interested in this, is the guide still a draft or was it validated? And if it is a draft, you know, when do you maybe expect it to be validated and published? Where can people find it? Kind of that type of question. We have two dates potentially. One is in May, one is in July. Just one of them might coincide with the large uh, uh, event we're having in, in DC, which is an annual meeting of UNDP on rule of law and human rights. Um, so, you know, we want to get it out as soon as possible and we want to start working, as Olga was said, directly with businesses and practitioners. And just to say, in the context of this call, to work directly with practitioners, anyone who picks it up and wants to speak to us about challenges they have with it or confusion or ways of improving it, we're completely open to that. It's, it has to be a living and working document. We're not the norm setters, so we're not going to push back on people who have uh, different opinions to us. We're very much on the practical side. We want to make sure it's usable, but we're also not fooling ourselves. So for example, we've had a, a good discussion recently with the mining and extractive sector who've looked at the, uh, some of the key aspects of the guide and said, this is helpful at one level. It takes it down from a very general level, but for our industry, it's going to need to be unpacked even more. So. Um, this could be another role for impact assessors to actually translate our guide, which is going to be very difficult even for businesses to translate immediately. And impact assessors can help translate it into something a little bit more practical. Uh, that could be a role for them as well. And would be happy to speak to you and work with you on that. Thank you. Great, thank Keep you. Keep going, Fine. Okay. All right, I think that's about our time. So do you have, do either of you two have anything else that you want to add in or kind of some final comments before we close up? Yeah, I just, yeah, we have a lot of questions and I, I don't know how we can, can we, can we follow up with some of those, Kesha, is that possible? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think we'd, we'd like to do that because uh, we want to learn more and, as, and I apologize for going a little bit over, we, we wanted to hear more. In general, look at, as we said, we see a huge role for impact assessors. Uh, I mentioned two areas, but I think the more the impact assessors understand about human rights due diligence, I think they will be able to carve out their role. But I do think that there is a huge skill set in, in impact assessors in terms of identifying risks. So that first big component uh, that I mentioned in human rights due diligence, assessors will have a huge role to play. And in terms of taking action, it's quite possible that further assessments of what the risks might be in more detail will be one of those actions. And that will be very much right in the, the typical field of impact assessors um, and then the final point is just to say that it is going to be a long and difficult process in terms of bringing these two worlds together. It's not, the good news is it's, it's kind of out of our hands. It's happening anyway. And I tried to make that point from the beginning of the presentation. It's not the UN pushing this necessarily. It's natural convergence where the uh, understanding of how these environmental harms are impacting humans um, is just, it's going to force us to, to consider the environment through a human rights lens. That's just the way the international community has even seen it to the recognition of right to healthy environment. Even in COP28, you see it happening the other way. The environmental world is starting to introduce more world uh, in like climate change negotiations on human rights and justice. So 
it's 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 happening regardless. We don't know exactly um, how we're going to do it. It's going to take some time, but I think impact assessors are going to play a key role, and we want to hear from them about how it's going to look in practice. So just to say thanks again very much for everyone for joining. Thanks, Kesha, for for facilitating questions. Olga, any final thoughts? No, thank you very much. Um, just to say that when the guide is published, it will have uh, a link to contact us um, if you would be interested in piloting it or having any insights, questions, whatever feedback. So we, we would uh, look forward um, to uh, working with you on improving the guide and, and uh, improving the policy, um, as some of you mentioned. So thank you very much for the opportunity again, Sean. No, I was just going to say thank you very much. And if anyone sees us in Dublin, please reach out to us. If we're looking for local tips, we'd be happy to, to meet up and, and, and keep you away from the tourist traps of Dublin um, to show you some, some local sites. So thanks again. Sorry, Olga, you're absolutely uh, bang on. We'll, we'll, we'll share a link so you can contact us. And back to you, Kesha. Perfect. And I will mention, like Sean and Olga have said, you know, if you would like to follow up, there's actually going to be a question in the closing survey at the end of the webinar that um, just states that they are interested in partnering with IA experts and businesses. So if you would like to get in touch with them and partner with UNDP, you will have an opportunity in the closing survey to indicate that and I will get you guys connected. So at this point, we are going to wrap up. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, again, just a quick reminder that if there was anything that you heard today during the webinar that you would like to share, please do so. You can tag us at IAIA Network and use the hashtag there, hashtag IAIA Webinar. But we know your time is valuable and we really appreciate you spending your time with us today. We hope that you found this valuable as well. As I kind of alluded to, there is going to be a survey at the end as you um, leave this webinar. And I really would encourage you to, to fill that out and take your time and give us some feedback because that's super valuable for us um, in making these webinars better better for you. And one of the questions there specifically is going to ask if there are any topics that you'd like to hear about in future webinars. And please, if there's anything that you want to hear about, let me know and I will do my best to get um, that on the docket and get that planned out for the future. So with that, have a great day and we will see you next time. Music, Kesha. <laughs>